I'm Melinda Lidecker, and I'm excited to have Greg Nichols join me today at our Hendersonville location. Hey, again, I'm Greg. I'm going to come to you in just a minute about our fescue and warm season lawn tips and also talk about armyworms. Here at our location, we sell the Elite Tall Fescue. You can buy it by the roll or you can buy it by the truckload. We also offer all the other products that you need to maintain your beautiful, healthy lawn. And Greg is going to take it from here. Thank you very much, Melinda. Uh, we're happy to have you. Happy to be here. It is September. We are in the mountains of North Carolina. And again, it's a beautiful place, beautiful place to be. Um, I hate that summer's gone, but you know, there's nothing better than the fall. And um, so, with that, we want to talk a little bit about armyworms, fall armyworms. Um, fall armyworms are a devastating insect. They're actually a caterpillar. And the one thing that we want to touch on is that this time of year, they can be very devastating to your lawn. Whether it's Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, centipede, fescue, you want to prevent your investment that you have. Uh, this year, we've seen very devastating um, amounts of fall armyworms they are going to chew on your lawn. They love grass, that's what they do. They, they come from uh, canopies of trees, they come from hard surfaces, they're just gonna fall down and then take the time to march across the lawn in a wave and that's why they get their name Army Worm. So again, we wanna make sure that you guys do your due diligence. If you have any kind of inclination that something may be wrong with the lawn, do a soap flush, please. It's no more than a couple teaspoons of your dish soap, Jaw, Dawn, Joy, Palm Olive, whatever you've got underneath the kitchen sink. Uh, add that into a gallon of so, two gallons of water. And then once you've got it nice and soapy, you're gonna turn around, apply that to a you know, two by two square foot area. Um, and then make sure you take a little bit of time, see if anything comes up. Do that in your infected areas, your green areas, I guess. Um, if you do it in the brown areas, they're probably already gone. So just do your due diligence, find spots, areas that look like it may uh, have some problems. And at that point, we can, you can treat. We do have products like Towstar and Wisdom in our stores that you can treat for. If you'd like a longer control, uh, preventative and curative type product, we have a Celeprin. It's on a fertilizer carrier. So we've got 5, 10, 30 with a Celeprin as well. So, do yourself a favor, protect your investment. Uh, they are devastating. You don't want to get caught in an army worm infestation. So make sure you do yourself, again, do yourself a favor, check, monitor, and then uh, prevent if possible. Going into uh, lawn tips for September. We're going to take a look at your warm season grasses initially. So warm season grasses are, are slowing down as the temperature continues to get cooler and cooler. Obviously, we're not going to do as much with it, right? So uh, no need to go out and fertilize. We want to continue to kind of back off those nitrogen, high nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, and really, if anything, you can always use iron. It'll kind of help with the green up a little bit if you want to keep that color in there. But later on, we're going to look at pre-emergence, okay? So right now, no fertilizers. We don't want to push anything. Things are, are about to start to uh, slow down. Continue to water, continue to mow. Again, don't let it grow higher than it needs to be. As you go into uh, dormancy, we want to continue to keep that grass cut, um, but you are going to continue to water. Those of you with Tif Tuff may not have to. You may not have had to water all summer. That's the great point about Tif Tuff and its drought tolerance. So. Uh, keep in mind, if we do get in dry spells, if the, the temperature does continue to stay a little bit warmer, you want to go ahead and water as needed. Now, again, when it comes to uh, preparation for the fall and going into your dormant months, we want to look at our pre-emergence and our um, fungicides. Now, don't go out and, and apply it right yet. Again, Mother Nature is going to kind of be that indicator probably a little bit later in this month, towards the end of the month, but go out. Uh, be sure to get your products early, that way your, your timing is right. And then um, with headway, we are preventing the rhizoctonia that's typically there affecting your fescue during the, the summer months, but your warm season grasses are susceptible during the colder temperatures. So that's your headway G. Uh, you may need a couple applications if it stays cool for a little while, but do yourself a, a favor and again, protect against it because it's not as noticeable now but it's gonna be more noticeable in the spring when you really want that grass to start greening up. Um, so we don't want setbacks, right? 
Uh, the other thing is pre-emergent. Now pre-emergent is still a little bit warm, but again, we want to prevent those winter annuals. How do we do that? We, we pre-emerge. Uh, if you are looking to overseed your tiff tuff, uh, your Bermuda grasses, we definitely don't want to use a, a pre-emergent at this point, but uh, most of your other warm season grasses, obviously we want to make sure we take care of those weeds, get them before they start. Again, it's still a little too warm, but as you start to get into the cooler temperatures, depending on your location and your area, make sure you get it down. So keep those weeds from coming up. We've had some wet winters before and, and certainly have had a tough time preventing some of those weeds, but uh, get it down, get it down, and, and make sure we prevent, again, going into the spring, we, we wanna make sure that we've got the best looking lawn as, as much as possible, right? Um, so again, your army worms are definitely gonna be a nuisance in warm season grasses. They will recover in most cases. Again, as long as the, the devastation isn't too much, Sometimes they may not repair themselves right away. Um, we may have to wait until spring to kind of see how things are going. But uh, with, that, with that in mind, I um, want to talk about fescue a little bit as well. So again, it is fall. It's that time of year where we really want to look at fescue grass and start thinking about overseeding, right? Uh, summer has kind of taken its toll and now it's time to do repairs, uh, replacements, whatever it may be. So when we think about fescue in the fall, we think about overseeding, aeration. Um, you know, this is the time where we wanna to start to clean it up. Again, no pre-emergent in your fescue right now. If you're putting pre-emergents down, you can forget about applying seed. It's just not gonna work, right? Uh, that's the idea. We wanna prevent things with pre-emergents. So we don't wanna prevent any of our new grass from coming up and growing. So again, don't worry about your pre-emergence. Make sure you get that seed down this time of year uh, and the next couple weeks or so forth. Again, everything we do is time sensitive and temperature related. So, um, you know, I can tell you to get your seed, but you want to wait until Mother Nature tells us it's the right time. Usually that's going to be in a few weeks or so as we get to a little bit cooler temperatures, consistent cooler temperatures. We want to give that grass seed the best chance of, of germinating and, and thriving. So. Um, in preparation for seed, we want to do, <clears throat> we want to get that grass ready, get rid of those weeds, eliminate your, your weeds as much as possible so that we can um, create less competition for that new grass. Uh, when you're herbicides, we want to make sure that you are reading that label. Again, when you're, you're applying a pre-emergent, or excuse me, I'm sorry, a herbicide to get rid of your post-emergence. Um, read the label. Make sure that if you're using something, how it affects your new seed. So give it time. If it says, you know, uh, just for instance, three to four weeks until seed, you want to make sure you give yourself enough time so that, again, you give the, the seed the right chance to, to grow, germinate and grow. Um, continue your mowing. Mow at your, your regular heights until it starts to cool down. If you want to drop it down a little bit later on next month, fine, but we're still a little warm. So keep your mowing heights about where they are and then uh, continue to water. Again, still a little bit warm. Don't take the water away from the plant as long as it needs it. And, uh, and you may have to continue to apply a fungicide. Again, Headway is a great product. Um, two modes of action to kind of help. And because we're still in that season where we're going to get afternoon thunderstorms, we're going to get a lot of rain, uh, we want to do our best at, at preventing those disease or any disease that we may be subject to. Lastly, I just want to push again on aeration and seed. And then when we are doing this, or even if you're establishing the importance of soil cube, I know we've talked about it time and time again, but soil cube creates such a great seed bed. Uh, once we're aerating and we're poking those holes, it allows um, that product to get into your clay or sandy soils, whatever soil type you have, that profile, it helps provide um, more nutrients down into that area. Uh, down into the soil surface and then uh, allows for more nutrients to be taken up by the plant. It gives the, the new seed a great seed bed. It's going to hold the moisture there for germination. Um, it's just going to be an overall better experience when you're trying to um, create repairs or even start a new yard uh, or a new lawn with fescue. So give it the best chance to grow. Give it soil cube and um, just remember, you know, let, let Mother Nature do its thing. 
but soil cube is the biggest advantage that I can I can tell you that you're you're going to get. Again, army worms love new sod, new fescue. It's like a, a big juicy meal to them, especially. So they love that tender new grass. So again, make sure you're continuing to prevent against army worms. Are going to be here until about the frost. So we still have a little bit of time. Uh, until frost gets here. Hopefully we have a lot of time until frost gets here because I'm, I'm not ready for the colder temperatures just yet. Uh, but that being said, make sure you do your, your prevention. Fescue really won't recover well, if at all, from armyworms. Um, so make sure you're doing your due diligence. At this time, I do want to turn it over for our weed of the month. Again, we've got Hillary Thompson. She always does a great job with these weeds. So Hillary, take Thanks, it away. Greg, you always do a great job with our lawn tips. Well, Appreciate you. it. That was me ramming my shovel, my next prop into the ground there. Um, the past couple of times I've shown you some of my favorite tools. And so I have a great shovel to show you next. Today's weed of the month is Dallas grass. I have a big clump of it with me. The scientific name is Paspalum dilatatum. Dallas grass has three lookalikes. This is the third in a series of grassy weeds common in the southeast that people have a hard time distinguishing from each other. I certainly did the first time I was studying them, but you will begin to recognize them at a glance when you're out on your walks and even when you're driving by. Um, you might become like me and start shouting out weeds when we're going out to dinner. Um, people really don't know how to respond to that, but um, it's, it's a fun thing. It's a fun game to play. But today, Dallas grass has some unique ID features and also some challenges with eradicating. So we're gonna launch into both of them right now. For every week of the month, we talk about how the clue, some clues about the plant are in the name. The scientific name is Paspalum dilatatum. Paspalum is from the ancient Greek word. It's not a modern Greek word, apparently. I don't know Greek though, but Paspalos, meaning millet. That tells you something about this plant. This plant, Dallas grass, is related to other edible millets. I cannot determine if this plant is edible or not. I don't think it is. It is definitely a forage plant. And that gets into the, sign, the common name, Dallas grass. It is named colloquial, colloquially after farmer A.T. Dallas, who grew a lot of paspalum dilatatum. They called it more commonly water grass or water paspalum is another common name, but has been named after him for reasons I was not able to determine. He was a uh, livestock, he grew lots of livestock and grew this grass for them. And it is, the common name honors that. The second part of the name, so we talked about paspalum being from paspalos, meaning millet. And a little aside about millets, there are dozens of millets and they span different genera. So we talked last week about finger millet and this is another common name, millet related to all those different genuses or genera that are edible. We talked about the common name being water grass or water paspalum. It tells you where this plant grows. It loves wet areas. It loves low-lying areas. It loves ditches. You will commonly find it in lower areas of fields, of um, crop, crop fields, and also um, infesting rice crops because of that, that standing water they grow in. This adapts well too. So I read. I have never actually seen a rice field. So that's one of those things I've just read about and I'm passing on to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the habit of this plant. And you know, I missed over the dilatatum part and I might have done that Freudianly because I don't know much about it. Dilatatum means dilated or expanded or spreading. I was not able to figure out what exactly botanically that refers to, whether it's part of the seed or something you look up under the microscope or whether it grows, certainly does grow in large um, spreading clumps, but I don't want to make anything up. I hope if someone who does know would ever comment on the in the comment section on YouTube about that I would love to learn from you talking about the habit it is a clump former 
It is a clump former, but it also sends out rhizomes that spread in smaller clumps. They are short rhizomes. They're not the couple foot long rhizomes that you'd see on Bermuda grass. They're, um, Donna, will you call up the habit? I think that will just explain everything. That is a clump of Dallas grass. It starts as a clump, like what I was holding in my hand here, and then it spreads out with these short rhizomes and it forms kind of an, a volcano look. Greg pointed out last month that it's very distinctive in that the lawn will then colonize back into the center of that, that Dallas grass. That's a picture of a Bermuda lawn. Zoysia lawns will also do it. Any, any colonizing lawn will grow back in there. And that's a typical habit you'll see. So if we want to go back to the clump I have here in my hand. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the stems on this plant. They're, they're a little bit flattish like goosegrass, but go goosegrass is much more conspicuous and it's more silvery and it's chunkier flat stems. Another distinctive characteristic is that this does not root at the nodes like crabgrass does. A node is where a leaf um, in, attaches to the stem. In crabgrass, the stems bend down and the roots form and it will colonize a large area spreading out like a crab. Dallas grass, like goosegrass, does not root at the nodes and that's a key ID feature. A little more about the stems. We talked about it having rhizomes. Rhizomes and stolons are modified types of stems. This plant has no stolons, so it's not gonna have the above ground runners like you would see on Bermuda grass and um, zoysia grass, but it does have the underground rhizomes, again, that form those clumps. Those rhizomes are what makes this plant really tenacious and hard to kill. Those rhizomes store carbohydrates. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I just wanted to plant that fact in your mind now. I'm gonna talk about the leaves a little bit. This was harvested yesterday, so I am losing a little bit of my show and tell here, but the leaves, here's one, has a prominent midrib. If you wanna pan in on that, Alex, you can maybe see it much more prominent um, by the midrib, that's that center rib in the middle of the leaf. I can see it there on the screen, thank you so much. That really separates it from goosegrass. And they're coarse, they're prominent, just about the same color as crabgrass and goosegrass as well. So look for those midribs. Now when we get to the flower, that's a lot more of a distinguishing um, aspect. I've brought a flower in with me and also a picture. Thank you for showing that. The racemes are also called fingers. In that picture, you see four racemes. You see that they alternate along the stem and they culminate in one terminal raceme. Usually they're in pairs um, of two to 10. I see a lot of two. Um, it seems to vary by patch. The patch where I dug what's in my hand all had two racemes. This patch where I took the picture all had four. Another distinguishing, so well, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bahay grass before I forget. Bahay looks exactly the same in terms of those seeds, those black seeds. I've heard them re referred to as poppy seeds. They're not poppies, but they look like poppies in, in their color and in their, their small round shape. And Bahay has a V shaped, if you want to cut back to me and what I'm holding. So by V, I mean like that. It's a terminal V on the top of the stem. Um, we also talked about, um, yeah, so these have the, the dancing alternating back and forth racemes. Both have black poppies, but this, is very, this makes it very easy to tell the difference looking at that. These seeds are it's something incredible to mow your lawn and then miss a few days. It rapidly goes to seed. So if you, are, you need to mow and you decide to take a nap instead or to do something else um, worthwhile, this can go to seed behind your back in just a matter of days. So you'll see your lawn, perhaps it just is two days late in mowing, maybe three. This plant will shoot up 
and go to flower in that amount of time. It's absolutely stunning and it is what makes this an incredibly um, prolific weed. That was a little hint about our mowing section, how important it is to keep mowing regularly if, if you have weed infect, infect, uh, infestations. <laughs> it is a type of infection, isn't it? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life cycle about the plant. It is not an annual. Every other weed we've covered so far in the weed of the month has been an annual. That means it goes to sea, it, form, it germinates, forms a, a mass, a biomass, and then goes to seed with, within a, a year, a certain, it could be months actually, but they call it an annual. Dallas grass is a perennial grass. It's a plant that was introduced to the United States as a forage crop. And we talked about the weeds and, um, I'm sorry, the seeds, and that's what spread this throughout. It loves full sun. It's going to grow in full sun. You're not really going to see it in much shade at all. Maybe some partial shade, but it needs a lot of sun. We talked too about the wet areas, commonly seen in ditches. And since it loves low lying areas so much, it also tolerates compacted soils very well. There are many plants that do that, that can come out of our swamps um, and be grown very um, successfully in compacted soils. Two examples you'll see every time you go to a mall or to a strip mall are red maples. Red maples grow in low-lying areas, river bottoms, even in swampy areas, yet as fully adaptable to the dry, harsh conditions of our parking lots because they're adaptable to low oxygen conditions. It's just as harsh in a wet area as it is in a compacted parking lot. Weeds like these and many plants we desire, such as the red maple, proliferate in compacted soils as well. It is a forage crop that we talked about. I believe it is still grown. I see many articles online about how to successfully grow this as a forage crop for your livestock. It is not suitable for all livestock, and I am not an expert in that, but if you're interested in that, that is something you will have to research yourself. Certainly, Farmer Dallas had a great time growing this weed for his livestock. I'm going to go in how to prevent this this voracious plant, <laughs> voracious in terms of eating up a lot of real estate. We talk every week about pre-emergent. Pre-emergent will work as well in inhibiting more seeds from germinating. This is one that will germinate in the winter, so this would be your February pre-emergent application here in the southeast. However, pre-emergent prevents weeds from germinating. It will not kill existing plants. So if you already have an infestation, large population, the pre-emergent will not kill it. It will come back next year. And that's an important thing to learn about and understand about its life cycle. It can be a little bit hard to grasp, but observe it and um, keep thinking it and studying. We talk all the time about the pre-emergent life cycle and when you need to apply. Greg was talking about in September for the winter weeds and all the summer weeds, it would be February. So just a little reminder about that. Mulching, of course, helps with all weeds. Mulch your flower beds, mulch your veggie beds. This is a weed in a lot of crops as well. And of course, you can always correct your soils. If you have a low-lying area of your yard that all, you know pools up, we've had a lot of rain, you, you certainly know where those areas are by now and you have a Dallas grass infestation, you can kill it out. And if you maybe, if your neighbor still has Dallas grass and you wanna prevent the weeds from them blowing into your gar garden and your yard and germinating, correct that soil. Bring in topsoil, bring in good quality soil so that water no longer stands in that area or correct your drainage issue. Or you know, you might need to do both in tandem to get that water running away from that low spot or going towards a ditch. Um, and improve that soil with compost. That might help as well, because we talked about how it loves the poor soils and the compacted soils. Compost improves com compaction. Now, one of our, you know, 
Besides the pre-emergent, we also talk a lot about the manual methods, and this is no exception. However, <laughs> it is so tenacious. It doesn't look like much, this root system here in this picture, but it is hard to pull up by hand, and something this small even, I could not dig up. So I brought my shovel, and this is one of my favorite tools. I've had this shovel for 15 years at least. You can tell it's much loved and beat up. It's, um, I think you can Google it by calling, by searching the term radius shovel, but it has these great um, step plates here. They're not small, they're nice and wide, they're more comfortable on my feet. It's also got a steel shaft through here that is, it's, I've snapped a few of <laughs> the wooden shovels. This holds up great and also has this great grip handle that's just super easy for me to grip. I don't have to be so precise about just gripping the end, but you'll need a shovel to dig this up. And we talk a lot about hand weeding with the family. Well, you can shovel weed with the family. Just get those kids out there, teach them good shoveling skills. It's a lifelong skill. It's great for weeding. It's great for learning how to plant trees, teach them how to dig a great, great hole, and um, great for learning how to vegetable garden and getting your sod laid too. So lifelong skill there, not just hand weeding. Um, shovel skills are important as well. And also mowing. Mowing with this is an interesting. So it, um, the forage crop website I was reading says, make sure you mow above three inches because under three inches, this, this forage crop won't respond well. And that tells me a little bit something that if I am, keeping consistently mowing my lawn, my lawn I mow at two inches. If I keep it consistent, don't let it get away from me, um, I'll be mowing this before it goes to flower like we talked about. Now I have read conflicting information that talks about how this is responding to lower mow heights and that's a little bit troubling but also it tells you just keep mowing regularly, keep mowing regularly. And what I mean by responding to low mow heights, and you might have seen it in Poa annua and some other weeds, is they just start flowering when they're shorter. <laughs> and that's a little bit threatening to me. Um, keep consistently mowing is the takeaway from that. Also, time and patience. That's our other uh, manual, that's under the manual category because it might take you uh, several, several years of pre-emergence, several years of digging and consistent mowing over the several years to really combat the weed population in your lawn and Great lawns aren't made overnight. It does take patience. It might take a couple of years to turn it around. And even um, I'll, myself, when I made, laid a new lawn two, two years ago, it took a couple of years to really get this weed control in this weed population in control. So just want to encourage you to set realistic expectations for combating weeds. It does take several years. And the last option is the chemical option, and it is also tricky with this with Dallas grass, and that goes back to the topic of the rhizomes. The rhizomes store carbohydrates, so when you spray an herbicide on this plant, those carbohydrates, the, the plant has stores of energy in the rhizomes, and it will grow back. Um, Greg pointed out that the first application will probably just yellow the plant and keep at it. And I wanna cover that a little bit more. Stuck um, a PDF that was given to me by um, Brandon Eubanks, who was the host of the Lawn Tips Live last month. He's the farm manager in middle Georgia. And he gave me this great flyer from Texas A&M Extension. It's called Dallas Grass in Turf Grass. You can Google that, but we also have it linked in our blog um, towards the bottom. We have some links to some other resources, but I want to read a quote here because it's, it's pretty interesting. It says, most herbicides only claim Dallas Grass suppression. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't read that right. Most herbicides only claim Dallas Grass suppression on the label. However, most of these products will provide some control if multiple applications are properly timed. And that's to encourage you, again, with the time and patience. 
This article recommends two applications in the fall and a third in the spring. So you're going to need some patience when you're spraying out. Also, a key point is that this is embedded in your lawn and you're going to have to use a non-selective herbicide on it. That means it will kill part of your lawn. There are a couple tricks to deal with that. One is using cardboard. This is what I do because this is a gently breezy day, but herbicide will, will spray and drift onto your lawn, other areas of your lawn and damage it. Use a large piece of cardboard, just take a box, recycle it, um, break it down so you can use it as a shield when you're spraying and prevent any drift. I've also heard people taking um, pipes. They take a pipe and they spray down into the pipe um, so that they're preventing any drift and they're localizing that spray. Also, Greg has a favorite tool and it's basically like a tank with a stick and a, a wand on the end. If you can envision an oil lamp, the wick in an oil lamp is kind of like that and you can then just brush the herbicide on these big coarse leaves that are up above your lawn. Maybe put a barrier down, maybe put that cardboard down, but then you can just target that plant and not kill your lawn. And when you, you kill out this plant, you'll, obviously you've, you've seen how big it is. It will kill out a patch of your lawn. Warm season grasses will grow back in. If it's not too big of a patch, spread some compost, water it extra, it will grow back in very quickly. Also, we sell single rolls. If you have a larger patch, and this does happen, if you, each roll covers 10 square feet, just come by and get a couple of rolls. And if you've got that bare dirt, after you've sprayed it out, get that grass back on and cover it. Cover that bare dirt so more weeds don't germinate there again. I'm done with my everything I know about Dallas grass. And I'd like Greg and Melinda to come back on. And while they're coming back, we forgot to show the, a little clip Alex had filmed showing where we are. We're here at Super Sod of Hendersonville. We're off of Jeffress Road, and this is the store. The store is in this beautiful spot overlooking the tall fescue fields. And we're there to the left of the field there. You know, of course, we're not in that picture, but that's, that's our fescue farm here in Hendersonville. <laughs> so please come back next month. It'll be October next month. Come back for our lawn tips then. Thank you. See you next month. <laughs>